Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living History. And if you're still with us, thank you for the third installment now of our Gallipoli adventures. But hopefully you're enjoying them because we are certainly enjoying making these podcasts because exploring the battlefields of Gallipoli is one of the best things you can possibly do. So we enjoy talking about it. I'm joined again by the irrepressible Mr. Peter Hart. Pete, great, another great day. It was a great day. Uh, lots of humour today at times, uh, perhaps. Uh, perhaps uh, we, <laughs> but it, it was just a great day. And uh, for me especially, uh, I, I enjoyed the chance to go back to Silt Spur this morning. So. Yeah, so I, uh, I I couldn't join you on the battlefields this morning. My, I had media commitments around Anzac Day, but you took the opportunity to go back and see some of the some of the sites we'd been to yesterday, including Silt Spur. If you don't know what we're talking about, go and listen to the previous podcasts it's the thing everyone's talking about at Gallipoli, the new trenches that have just been uncovered at Siltspur. How was, was it to go back well, the third it, day in a row? What was so great? I just I went on a little buzz around the beach with them, uh, you know, with uh, to, 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 with some friends to uh, to show them where they were, and then I took them there. And what, you know, that map just makes it all come to come to life. And we were we were drooling about it yesterday, but I went back and I was sort of thinking. Is it as good as is it? Is it this good? Can I really trace these? You know, Matt traced them, but can I do it? Uh, and I went out there with the map, and it is there. And you know, and for me, the periscope, uh, the periscope post was is the highlight because you can trace it back, and then there's these pictures. There's a picture taken from a, that or the other periscope post, and you just look out and you think, wow, and. Again, we we talked about this yesterday, but wow, a, a great moment. Yeah, and, that's uh, a great. And that's it wasn't just you being brilliant on maps or anyone <laughs> making it up. It is real. You can follow the Tenth uh, Australian Battalion map, which is available on the AWM, and you can find your way around. Perfect. I uploaded that map as well to the Facebook page and to Twitter. So if you are planning on going to Gallipoli, or in fact you just want to follow these adventures we're having uh, in, in a map format, you can certainly uh, do that by downloading that map. But um, yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't there. I would have liked to have come, but I joined you in the afternoon <laughs> for quite an adventure. We had Bulent, Bulent with us, the, the wonderful Turkish guide, although I think we even we, even, we stretched even him today with our expectations. We, we did stretch him because uh, we, 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 um, there, there was some administrative problems in where we could <laughs> and couldn't go, and we annoyed a lot of different policemen by saying, we're going just up there, we'll be back in a minute. No, It's, the, it's the day before Anzac Day, and so obviously security is very tight. Most of the peninsula is shut down in some manner or another. Uh, they, we, still, we still got where we're going. <clears throat> they were all lovely to us as well. There was no anyway, any, nothing unpleasant about what happened. It's just we were trying to do something that was pushing against reality. Uh, so we had uh, before hell is open. We had uh, a couple of hours basically, because hell is opened at fourteen hundred. So we uh, we we did something I've never done. Uh, one of the reasons I've never done it is because it's stupid. Um, but that is, we, we went up to Maltepe, the cone-shaped hill of legend, uh, which was the original Australian uh, objective of the first day. Uh, we often think of Gun Ridge, Third, Third Ridge, as being the first objective, uh, you know, the objective, but it, that was just on the way <laughs> to Maltepe. And, you know, what, what did you think about the, 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 the route Belent took us to, to, to the route? Uh, you know, well, th- I'll, let, me, let me paint a word picture. So Maltepe is, if you've been to Gallipoli, the, the Anzac sector is very contained. It's a small area on the coast because basically that's as far as the Anzacs got and the Turks held them up there on the coast. Way inland, way, way, way across the other side of the peninsula, you pass it every time you drive to the Anzac sector, uh, is a little hill. As you drive past, it's a little hill. And as historians, we often point it out and we say this was the objective for the Anzacs on the first day of the campaign. Um and yeah, I it was great. I mean, the the route that we took, it answered your question. The route we took was uh, somewhat complicated and not direct, but we drove, and we walked, and we walked, and we walked, and we as we always do, we clawed through scrub, and eventually got to the top of this hill and discovered there was a beautiful road that went straight up the side that we could have practically driven the car all the way up there. But it's part of the adventure, Pete. That's yeah. it's the Gallipoli adventure is making silly decisions about the easiest way to get to places. I mean, that was the campaign, wasn't it? The Gallipoli campaign was all about, and I only say this partly in jest, the Gallipoli campaign was all about do we go left or do we go right? If we could just get on top of that ridge, maybe it would all open up. We experienced that today. How do we get to the top of that high ground? We should have just like the gone left. We should not yeah. have gone right. <laughs> We've established the rule at Gallipoli for anyone who decides to do a bit of exploring is always go left. If you're ever, but I don't know what it is, but it's never failed us. If you are encountered with two, two different ways to go, Choose the left path and you'll be fine. But um, what did you think of being up there? So, the, again, the, the significance is this was the first day objective for the Anzacs and the idea was that once they secured this hill, they would control 
Turkish roots, basically in and out of the peninsula. So what what was revealed to you, Pete, when we got up the top? Well, first, the, the big disappointment was there was no view across to uh, Anzac, uh, which I was hoping for, but it was blocked by trees. Just, you know. But you did get a wonderful view across the plain and uh, to the, across to the Straits. Now, that's good because it shows why it was considered an important hill because it, it did have a domination, which actually, actually, Barber in the Hellas session. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about this because this is a really interesting comparison for me. When we talk about hills that were objectives for the Allied troops, just tell us that that story of the one in Helles, which is called Archibaba. Well, the one in Helles, uh, Archibaba is, uh, you know, it, it fixated the British after after the first couple of days. Um, I've climbed it many times. You get up there and uh, you get a perfect view of Helles. It is a tactically important position. But if you walk to the back of it, you cannot see the Narrows at all. What you can see is that the giant plateau of Kilid Bahir right in front of you. That is a serious, serious objective. And there's a load of valleys and hills and ranges, uh, which are a real problem. Um, you know, it would, be, it would cost a lot of lives to get across. Um, Mal Tepe is more obviously important. Uh, because uh, it does actually seem to offer control of the route through to Eshabad. It seems to offer uh, a domination over the valley, you know, uh, that leads to Anzac. Uh, does it offer any real chance of taking Kilid Bahir next day? Because th- th- you know the schedule, first day. I think you had a joke to put at the end of this. First day, uh, we take uh, Achibaba and uh, Maltepe. Second day, we take Kilid Bahir. Third day, the fleet go through. And fourth day, Matt? It rains beer. <laughs> we we came up with this little ditty to describe how ridiculous the Gallipoli plan was. They were going to take the peninsula in three days. It was ludicrous. Um, but it was great. You know what I enjoyed about it, Pete? This was genuine what if history. You know, we were answering the question: What if the Gallipoli landings had gone as planned? What if the Allies? What if the Anzacs had advanced across the peninsula, swept the Turks away, and captured this hill, which was their first day objective? What would it mean for them? And you can do the, exactly the same exercise at. Cape Helles down on the southern toe where the British were fighting and indeed most people who go to Cape Helles will do this exercise they will go to the top of Archibaba as Pete said when you get to the top of Archibaba the the shock horror moment is that Archibaba doesn't show you the Dardanelles the objective that you're there to capture it's a fraud it is a fraud so it, it would not have helped the British in any meaningful way even if they had been successful capturing it but I think the interesting comparison today and not one that I think too many people have done was to go to the top of Maltepe like we did and see that had the Anzacs taken that it would have done what they needed it to do, which was give them control of that part of the peninsula. And the Turks would have been cut off had the Anzacs taken that. Hit. But it would not have helped take Kilid Bahir in the sense that that could be uh, uh, supplied from the sea. Yeah, from, absolutely. Yeah. And it certainly wouldn't have helped in the objective of capturing Constantinople and knocking <laughs> Turkey out of the war. But that was a good experience. Um, you know, something that not mo- that most people would not bother to do when they're... Uh, I'd never done it. I don't think you'd done it. No, and, I certainly uh, hadn't. And Bolent certainly hadn't in done spite it. Of, in spite of his <laughs> protest to the contrary, I don't think Bolent, our guide, had done it either. But um, but that was a great experience to kick the day off. And then we headed south to Helles, which is a sector, if you're an Australian listener, you probably are not as aware of Cape Helles as you should be um, because this was where a lot of the fighting, this is where the British and the French fought the bulk of the fighting that, that most occurred, of the casualties, yeah, occurred in Cape Helles in the southern toe. So, I mean, Anzac is very, very important, but we shouldn't look at it in isolation. And so, today we went down to Kelp to Cape Helles to do a little bit of exploring. Um, tell us about what we got up to. Well, uh, things went wrong again, uh, but uh, <laughs> this time we we were going to do the Gully Ravine walk, starting at uh, Gully Beach. Uh, which was not uh, defended by the Turks during the landings, but had Turks there, but was overrun without fighting. And Gully Ravine is an interesting feature. It's much deeper than it looks on the maps. You know, you can see it's a significant feature, but you don't get the idea of the depth. They're sort of 100 feet deep at places. You know, it's also very wide in places, very narrow in places. It's tortured. Um, and we just wanted to have a look at the uh, the, be- the beach area, the, the, and, and then uh, and then move up the gully, do the whole walk. And uh, I really, really hoped that uh, Matt would fall into a fairly deep area of water. That that wasn't to prove, but that was I, I, su- I, I survived the, uh, the the trap of falling in water, which Peter wanted me to do. But Gully Ravine really important to the British campaign, wasn't it? Like, like iconic in the, the British history of the Gallipoli it, campaign. It, uh, there was some really serious fighting at the top of it. Uh, the, uh, for the rest of it, it is fundamentally a gigantic sort of 60-foot deep, 40, 100-foot wide, you know, 100-foot by 100-foot wide. 
communication trench at which everything would go up and down. Um, it's um, it's really interesting. There's lots of things to see um, in the sense of you, you get the idea of what, what the suffering of those brought in down in ambulances would be. Uh, wooden and steel wheeled ambulances with no suspension uh, dragged by horses at whole, you know and they the, you know agonies they suffered those with broken bones and things so we, we were thinking about that um, we uh, we, we ju- it, it's just a, a really nice walk uh, does it repay the Australian the effort put in we're not, we're not sure are we Matt uh, yeah as a I mean as a historian I was absolutely intrigued um, not to be the one-eyed Australian but I think to an Australian visitor, particularly someone short on time, it would not be at the top of the list for something to do because it is time-consuming. It's it's quite difficult in parts. You've got to you've got to be relatively fit to do it. Um, but if you're looking for that next layer of history and you really want to dig deep into the Gallipoli story, it was absolutely fascinating. I mean, some of the places that you took me to, in the, you know, gun pits and collapsed dugouts and trenches and Derek's dump. So not forget well, about I'd, forgot, I'd forgotten that, but uh, what did you think of Derek's Dump then? Derek's Dump was quite fascinating. In spite of the name, it was actually uh, quite an appealing destination to visit. It's basically, uh, I, I think, Pete, you pointed out that it's probably uh, there was probably a cookhouse nearby, a place where they prepared food in this sheltered area of the gully. Um, and it's just, a for whatever geological reason, which I won't even begin to try and understand why, um, food tins have just been coming to the surface in recent years, and the the whole area now is is you know a, a, an area of several well, square meters is now littered with with food tins from where they were cooking. And, an and important part of the story. We we focus on combat so much, but we should remember if you've got literally hundreds of thousands of people crammed into a space, you've got to feed them. You've got to they've got to sleep. They've got to eat. They've got to drink water. Um, they've got to eat food, and the food came in tins. So a great insight into the logistics and they were so recognizable because you know they are iconic shaped tins so there's a mcconaughey's tin with uh, the lamb and vegetable absolutely identifiable you know a flat very round but quite big uh that the uh you you, you spotted uh the uh the, the corned beef tin oh, bully, you know the famous bully beef in the rectangular tins there was there was half a dozen right with, there with the, and, and the key so we later on you found a key in the field which yeah that's sort of, right you'd be you'd have you know had a whole meal on a plate there so uh, <laughs> No, but interesting stuff. You know, interesting aspects of the campaign we don't normally uh, focus on. You certainly don't focus on it when you're visiting the memorials and cemeteries. As the logistics of feeding an army is not discovered. So um, it was great. I really enjoyed it. And then we moved further up um, through the gully. And got, we got to, uh, well, we got to a place where two things happened. Well, firstly, we were, let's say we went into Gagan's, uh, Gagan's Bluff, which is a field, a sort of low field that sort of branches off the bottom of the gully in a, in a quite strange geological manner, I would imagine. Um, it's sort of, it's farmed, uh, it's ploughed field. I think you really enjoyed looking looking around that. Oh, area. anyone that knows me would know I'm a total nerd when it comes to walking across a freshly ploughed field because you just find so much stuff. And I don't keep stuff these days if you find relics from the fighting I don't keep it because I don't think it's the right thing to do. And I'd say the same to everyone listening. If, if you go to a battlefield, don't take items home that you find on the battlefield. Um, but my my system of looking for imp- you know relics from the fighting and then photographing them um, worked very well today, and was uh, was I was greatly rewarded because that field was absolutely littered with with artifacts from the fighting. The, I mean. That one of the most common things you'll find on the battlefield is the the humble rum jar, the the ceramic jar that uh, that they carried rum rations in. And um, this field, we could have built dozens of rum jars if we wanted to reassemble the broken shards, uh, just relics all across the field. I found a nice button from a, a British great coat, um, all sorts of bits and pieces, bullets, shrapnel balls, heaps of things. And it's a fascinating place because it, it, although it's a field, it's, two, it's basically two fields at uh, uh, different levels. Um, that there were, it was great because there was it, that's where one of the burial grounds was, and we, we uh, Belent showed us the uh, one of the markers, and you know we that that was where uh, uh, quite a few British soldiers were buried. They later moved to another, but it was Cop- also where I found the button from the greatcoat. So that well could have been from one of the men buried there, wrapped in his greatcoat, uh, buried on the spot. And then on the slightly higher up is where they played uh, the uh, the Dardanelles Cup. They played football matches, and uh, yeah, I know Australians don't like football. Or I think last time they beat us, beat the English. Last time they played <laughs> us, but um, they're not normally very good at it. Um, but um, there was a, a competition and uh, between the various battalions, especially the Royal Naval Division, but some of the regular battalions. And it was wonderful to stand there and have a look and just think that's where they played football up there. And uh, it was a really great spot. And I've got to say the. 
what happened next was your disappointment was actually uh, gave us a bit of a new aspect to our adventure because we discovered there'd been a landslide recently which had blocked off the gully and it had water had backed up behind it and effectively formed a large lake in the gully so we couldn't continue up through the gully so we had to climb up out of the gully and then walk across the spurs that were the famous killing grounds of the the Cape Helles area and the reason for that is, without going into too much detail, it's it's described as as uh, like fingers on a hand, these long spurs coming down the peninsula um, with valleys in between them. And because we could no longer go in the gully, we had to climb up and walk down one of these spurs. And then um, we, that was gully spur we went gully to spur, first. Yeah. And it you know it it was nice to see or just to see where it happened because that's where the attack of sixth, seventh, eighth, uh, the British were attacking there. The mainly the um, uh, the forty second East Lancashire Division. Uh, I'd interviewed two or three of them, and so for me, it's always special. But what you found interesting was just what a great killing zone it was. You oh, know, just we we saw where the machine gun posts were at the top of uh, Y Beach, um, and you you pointed out just wow. Do you want to attack across that? It was it was quite remarkable. So the the the, the principal um, aspect of these attacks that went in particularly in the earlier months of the campaign, up until about June, I think, if I'm correct, Pete, was that it was basically British um, Allied troops attacking across very exposed ground on the tops of these these ridges that ran down the, the peninsula. Um, and I've been there before, but often I'm, I'm in the wrong spot or I, you know maybe there's a crop in the field or something, but we were just lucky today that the, there were no crops in the fields. It was all clear. And again, you can't... If you read about a battle of the First World War, you'll read about the enemy on the high ground dominating the position and then the attackers going in and getting mowed down by machine gun fire. I've never seen a better illustration than what we saw today. We were just standing on this ridgeline. It's a bright, sunny day, you know, and no one's shooting at us, yet you're very exposed. You're standing on the top of a ridgeline and you're looking around and the area where the Turks were is above you and just towering over you. And, and one man with a machine gun in that position would have stopped an entire battalion from advancing along that ridge line. So I, th- I thought that was... I, I know we were disappointed not to continue in the gully, but to get up on the, the ridges and to just see how those attacks bogged down and why the casualties were so high and, and how brilliant the Turks were at defending. There's no better way to put it. The Turks sighted their machine guns and their infantry very, very well and very effectively choked out any advance along those ridge lines. And again, it's it's... The terrain is nothing like Anzac. It's 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 sort of rolling countryside, with the exception of Gully Ravine. Um, so we don't see the steep cliffs and things like that at Anzac. But in its own way, still impossible country, just because it's so exposed. Well, uh, uh, adva- it was an advance to contact. There weren't many trenches, and you know the scraped trenches, and and you're just incredibly vulnerable. So so that was re- I thought that was really interesting. It cheer- cheered me up. Uh, and then we went back, because of my slightly childish nature, uh, we went back into the gully because I was determined to show you the uh, the British and Turkish front lines on the 4th of June. And that went well. We were very well led there by Bolent, whatever jokes we made uh, earlier about uh, uh, Maltepe. Uh, he was brilliant. He took us uh, straight to where we wanted to go um, without any messing about. Uh, it was quite challenging at times, actually. I, it, it did occur to me. Uh, but we found these two facing trench lines, uh, redoubts. Uh, um, and, you know, I, people always ask, uh, are they man-made? Because they look man-made. It's just, it's, it's I, I, I mean, I think you probably take it a little bit for granted, Pete, because you've been there so many times. I was shocked when I saw them. Imagine, to paint a little bit of a picture, imagine separated by 150 feet of space, two opposing trench lines in the bottom of a valley a steep gully but these trench lines are natural formations of stone so you've basically got two opposing stone walls which when you're trying to dig in and find a defensive position is a a natural defensive position so the british dug in against one the turks dug in against the other and that became the front line and they're still there today but they're the oddest things i've ever seen i can uh, i believe you when you say they're naturally occurring but i can understand why people are confused and and to me, what I, I would have guessed that they were large boulders that the British and the Turks had brought in and then somehow cemented together because that's what it looked like. It was like a almost like a stone wall, um, but naturally occurring features because we saw other ones as well in different parts of the gully, um, which were not related to um, to defensive positions. Um, and then uh, you uh, recounted a, a story uh, you you read from a, a letter for, of a soldier there, which was 
that, pretty, that, pretty moving. That was Reginald Savory, just you know, uh, describing what it was like to send his. But he was in the 14th Sikhs, and they attacked on both sides, but mainly pushing up the gully. And he just said it was against everything he'd ever been taught. Uh, uh, but mostly, I find the personal aspect. He was talking about how he felt before he went over the top, and how it was just like being at school in a race or rugby game where you, you feel you've got to go, you know, and then waiting for the the starting gun. And then when he went, he said he was completely isolated. And this is the common. I know you must have found this with talking to old soldiers. Uh, they're almost completely isolated in battle. You know, they can't, and it's very difficult for them to influence what's going on on either side, especially a junior officer. And uh, he uh, he got to the Turkish trench um, and then bayoneted this Turk, and it was quite a, a moving thing. Uh, the Turk was almost certainly wounded and dying anyway. He described the Turk as just an ordinary bloke. You know, this this perception. He was just an ordinary looking man. I think was was the the term. He just and and he wasn't even he wasn't even fighting. He was just leaning up against the trench. But he probably would have shot me if I gave him a chance. So I jumped in and I think skewered him against the back wall of his trench. Was the rather it was colourful like her- description. <clears throat> Um, that he used. So it, I've got to say, Pete, it was remarkable to stand there. Again, the the, the wonderful thing that you deliver um, in your your incredible work as oral historian and having interviewed all of these veterans to stand in those spots and hear those personal accounts. But I've got to say, we did it uh, yesterday, um, and as revealed in yesterday's podcast on Bloody Angle and the talking about the machine gun that took out all these troops. That one you could imagine. You were standing right in that spot, and you were you were transformed there. You you were, went back in time to 1915. Today, it wasn't like that at all. Gully Ravine today is like a fairy wonderland. There was a little trickling brook at the bottom of it. It's all overgrown now with scrub, some really quite beautiful scrub, unlike the harsh, thorny stuff we'd been bashing through at Anzac. Beautiful trees, birds singing in the tree. It was gorgeous. You know, it could be on a, it's a, it's a cliche, but it could be on a postcard. You could see that anywhere and think that this is a wonderful holiday destination. I go camping next to, this is the spots I look for when I go camping with my kids. Um, really a lovely spot. And I, even now thinking back on it, there was no way you can make that leap um, back to what they went through. And I, I, can, I, I stood there and heard you talk about that man uh, and how he killed this Turkish soldier in very much that spot where we were standing. Um, and I couldn't make the leap. But I, I think in some ways that's, that's not a bad thing. It's, we want to understand what they went through, but we don't want to relive it. So I think um, it's just, a, again, a really special experience, a strange experience, unusual. I, it was unexpected to me. I think that's the word for Gully Ravine. I, I hadn't been up there before. It was not what I expected. I knew the stories. I'd read the history about this, uh, this, this thoroughfare that the British used throughout the campaign, um, but remarkable to get up there. Once again, let's reiterate our disclaimer from yesterday. Uh, not a walk you would want to do unless you had a good Turkish guide. Not as dangerous as some of the ones at Anzac because there's no steep cliffs you could fall off like uh, like at Anzac. Um, but again, you don't want to go on your own. Um, you could you could pr- you could probably do it without a guide. I would suggest. Yeah, no, I won't even say that. Always always have a good Turkish guide with you, but um, definitely don't do it alone um, because it's quite isolated. Like everything in Gallipoli, you're going to be on your own. Um, there, there's not going to be help very close at hand, but. Um, Anything else we should add about Gully Ravine? Well, the only thing is we didn't, because we didn't go back the same way. We came out by a Firth Trench, Frith Trench, Firth Trench, Frith. Uh, and um, we didn't really follow in the gully. It was a scene of incredible slaughter of the Turks on the 28th of, uh, of June and uh, the Turkish counterattacks that followed. And it is one of the great terrible areas uh, for Turkish uh, military history. You were saying that, that local Turkish guides don't go in there, some of them, because they think it's haunted. Scary, haunting, depressing. Like like we find certain places uh, like Auschwitz, we they're depressing, uh, d- deeply depressing. And uh, they find this this scene of the, so many of their countrymen being killed, deeply depressing. And it's in mass killing. Uh, they they used to say that the uh, that the skulls lay across the battlefield like a melon field, uh, and they were collected up by an officer uh, of the Turkish army only in the 1930s. It, it's um. It, for them, it's a serious thing. But we didn't concentrate on that while we were in, because we left by uh, Frith Trench. I tried to send Bolent away, which would almost guarantee him going in the uh, in the, the the water, which is quite deep there. But he, he has the agility of a, of a blasted gazelle. I mean, he didn't fall in. So we went the other way and uh, got into Frith Trench and then went out up onto fir tree spur uh, where we look we, we again it's this open nature of the ground again you commented on that and then we went to look at the boomerang which was a very strong turkish defense uh, feature which was taken out on the 28th of june as well and i think you pointed out 
what a strong natural position the boomerang was in, uh, able to interfere with any action the British took on uh, Gully Spur. Yeah, just again, high ground views uh, over three quarters of the, the sort of the, the battlefield. Again, very well sighted. We don't give the Turks enough credit for the defensive position. I'm the one always saying, oh, the terrain was as big an enemy as, as the Turk. And that is true. The terrain played a very important factor. But the Turks took advantage of that terrain. That's why they were such good defenders. And this was a great example. Again, it's just a field today. We're standing on a slope. But knowing that it was the scene of that uh, very major action during this attack. Um, and again, walking across the field, found a British bullet, probably fired from a machine gun at some stage during the attack. Uh, and lots of chunks of big, probably mortar shells or even naval shells. Fired well, the because that was part of the story. It's uh, one big part of the story was we borrowed uh, the French Demoiselle uh, mortars, huge, quite old-fashioned, probably out-of-date mortars, uh, to 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 lob huge shells. There's, we have accounts in the War Museum of these shells going and crashing down on the boomerang before uh, a really, really well-organized attack on the 28th of June. We found evidence of it today. You know, I always love that. I always, you know, that, that's the importance of relics. That's the importance of finding things. It, it's tangible. It, it brings, that is a direct connection with the history. You, you hear that the British fired their machine guns in support of the attack and then you find a machine gun bullet. That, you, know, you hear that these huge mortars were fired on that position and you find fragments of huge shell, which could only have come, you know, they were way too large, these chunks, to be from anything except either these French mortars or possibly naval fire from the naval ships. But why but, would they be firing there? And it's very flat trajectory. Naval shells have a lot of trouble getting there. Yeah, so again, a really nice way to end the day. A different day from the, the previous two that we spent in Anzac. Um, but what I always say about Gallipoli, it's it's a big story and you've got to read every chapter of it. You can't just concentrate on the Australians and New Zealanders at Anzac. And we're going to head back to Hellas tomorrow and do some more exploring, uh, particularly getting out of the French sector, which is something I have done barely anything of at all. So I'm really looking forward to that. Again, Pete, thank you again for another wonderful day if i was here on my own i'd just be wandering around like a lost puppy so thank you for taking me and showing me these um fantastic sites it's you know exactly where you go but it's a pleasure to be with you cheers mate we will talk again tomorrow um thanks very much cheers